What's your shirt say? It says that's pretty neat. Oh, dude. <laughs> Have you had that? Yeah. It was actually at home for quite a while. <laughs> it's pretty neat. Yeah, it would have fit in for a lot of the time this summer <laughs> that we were referencing. Welcome that. back, everyone, to the Hunting Public Podcast. We're just now going live. Tonight's episode is brought to you by Legendary Whitetails, our partners over there. We've, uh, we're up, we, a lot of us got on Legendary gear right now. Wear it every day. And uh, we've got an exciting episode for you tonight. We've got a very cool guest, a turkey slaying machine from uh, down in Georgia. His name is Dave Owens, and he just uh, won the 2018 NWTF Grand National Calling Competition, which I've been in, and it's really hard to do that. <laughs> like, yeah, I, he's really good. So, and he's killed uh a bird in every state that turkeys exist in yes which is 49 i believe tell them which one they don't because i had to ask the only them. yeah jake didn't know earlier the one state there is not turkeys in right Hawaii. now is alaska <laughs> but yeah we're gonna we're gonna be picking dave's brain on all kinds of stuff turkey and turkey hunting and just as a disclaimer up front we've got wires going everywhere in here <laughs> we were just talking to dave about it on the phone a while ago we're trying to get audio streams from various different places tonight so that we can bring you guys this podcast. And if there's some technical difficulties along the way, don't be surprised. Uh, we're hoping that we can avoid it. But uh, yeah, should be interesting. We've got Dave on the phone. I don't want to keep him waiting any longer. How's it going, Dave? Uh, doing pretty well, buddy. How about you guys? Doing great. I'm doing good. Just rolled back into town tonight. Yeah, Jake just got back into town. Also Weird. known as President Sturgeon. <laughs> Jeez. I didn't name myself that. <laughs> oh, boy. How you feeling this week, Dave, nope. after winning that contest, man? Oh, well, it's kind of, it's still kind of sinking in. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a big deal, apparently. I mean, you get, you get uh, calls from a little bit of everybody, you know. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, feeling good because... Uh, you know, it's I get to I get to start turkey hunting at the end of next week, so that's the big deal for me. Yeah, where are you starting this season at, Dave? <clears throat> you will be down in South Florida. I usually always start down there. Uh, they start as early as you can you possibly start, so <laughs> unless you fly to Hawaii. So. Yeah. yeah, you usually go down there first, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I uh, I go down there uh, and start my season every year. I I just can't stand knowing if there's a season. <laughs> in somewhere and i'm not i'm not taking part in it so yeah i usually i usually start my season down there in the swamps every year yeah i know what that feeling's like i think we all do <laughs> yeah yeah greg w greg and i were looking through a bunch of your photos uh, earlier today and uh you and i have talked about this before and how you hunt a lot of public land down there in florida and you wear crocs half the time and <laughs> wade across that those canals and that water to get to, out into uh some of those areas and one of those pictures i think you wading across one of those little sloughs or something and you got a turkey in your vest <laughs> oh yeah yeah that's uh that's common practice down there we uh first few years i mean everything you know there's a learning curve with everything and we started with those knee boots that everybody and a lot of people still wear and if it works for them that's cool but i just figured out that we were spending a lot of time trying not to get our feet wet rather than actually you know making it to where we wanted to be so i just started you know putting on crocs or some old tennis shoes and something and just jumping out and getting wet uh getting wet from the beginning and then you figure out that you get from point a to point b a lot quicker um which is pretty important down there if you do get lucky enough to get one of those birds down there gobbling uh you need to get to him pretty quick because you're usually not the only person that hears him so uh crocs have have worked for us uh a pretty good bit yeah <laughs> it's pretty cool yeah i suppose it's warm enough where you don't have where you'd rather wear the crocs instead of dumping out your boots all the time down there usually huh oh yeah absolutely you wear something uh that, that dries quick um wet boots leave blisters i have found yeah <laughs> um but uh sometimes if it's a dry year you can get get away with uh with wearing just you know regular you know hiking boots or something which i'll do mm -hmm. um, but i'm always sure to not wear a new pair because most likely if it needs to get wet it will get wet so um but yeah the crop or you know something that you can 
throw away at the end of the hunt because that's usually what happens after those things stay wet for about nine days they're not fit for anything so yeah not to mention that they smell right after nine days of <laughs> swamp water <laughs> yeah i suppose you could pitch them though cro- what's a pair of crocs like 12 bucks or something yeah. like that <laughs> Never oh yeah exactly exactly you can you can you can which is the thing with crocs is they don't hold smell they're you know they're that whatever material that is rubber and so you can you can you can hold on to a pair of Crocs, or if you wear a pair of boots or tennis shoes, yeah, you better look to to uh, to make them somebody else's problem after you get done hunting with them for a week. <laughs> There's that picture you were talking about. Yeah, yeah, there's where Dave is wading across that, that water. That's pretty wild. Well, we got... Yeah, t- I think... Go ahead, Dave, that's sorry. If I'm, if, I'm thinking, if I'm thinking, Roger, I'm probably looking at a picture from two years ago, maybe. I think it was two years ago. Um... It's a wet year. I mean, you have wet years and dry years down there, and uh, that was a wet year. I mean, when it's wet down there, um, it can be, you know, you're in water more than you're out of water that particular year. I remember getting out of the truck, and we jumped out of the truck into about, I don't know, nearly a foot of water. So hmm. it, it wasn't hard to, to, to make the plunge. All, you know, when it's a little bit dry, it's always you walk to that first water hole, you're like, here we go. We got to get our feet wet. Let it take our breath for the first time, and then it'll be okay. It didn't take long on those wet years. You jump out of the truck, and you're you're wet from from uh, from the first point that you jump out. So, um, but yeah, that was a wet year, and that was just one of the uh, the trails that we were walking. I mean, we probably walked. I don't know that. I mean, you're walking literally, you know, quarter half mile at a time in water. You know, anywhere from thigh deep to, you know, we try not to get over thigh deep, but. Uh, <laughs> that it gets in our vest but yeah it's pretty it can be crazy down there but then on dry years you know you can walk you can hunt and sometimes not get your feet wet so you can't ever tell hmm. that's interesting man you lucky dog you'll be down there hunting in no time <laughs> oh yeah yeah we'll be cutting out of here next friday so i can't i'm uh that's what we're i'm getting the truck ready now i'm getting the getting the back of the truck ready to sleep out of and hmm. getting all of our equipment in there and <clears throat> getting ready for the whole that whole uh grind the whole the whole sleeping out of the truck and being able to take off at a moment's notice and having everything you need to live in the back of the truck and you know uh getting all of that all the eyes on and t's crossed amen well for everybody that's listening that's just joining in with us right now like we said in the in the open Dave has killed a turkey in 49 states, all 49 states where they exist. Mm-hmm. That's called the U.S. Super Slam. And there's actually not a whole lot of people that have accomplished that. And uh, A lot of public land, you said? Yeah, Dave's killed a lot of them off of public land, and we're going to get into a bunch of questions about that. But before we do, Dave, uh, you guys are starting up this, this pretty cool project that I wanted to talk about first off. It's called the Pinhody Project. Why don't you fill the listeners in on uh, what that's all about? Uh, the Pinhody Project is something we just launched literally about a week ago, and we haven't haven't uh, got some stuff you know backlogged, but we haven't really put anything else out about it yet. It's fixing to happen, um, but essentially, it's just uh, it's just going to be um, kind of working off the framework of what a lot of the big game guys are doing out west, and, and even a little bit kind of of what you guys have done with uh with the hunting public and and whatnot but um just more turkey related uh to where i go on these extensive like my my turkey seasons are pretty extensive and they you know they start as early as they can possibly start and they go as late as they can possibly go which is usually into the very end of may or even into june um uh when allowed to so i usually put up these end of season posts for people that follow me um or just uh kind of mesmerized by the amount of, of traveling I do and, and the amount of, uh, of days that, that we put in and everybody sees like, you know, I get a lot of the you're so lucky comments and yeah. you're living the dream comments and all that. And I will agree, um, it comes with a lot of compromises, which I'm sure you guys can relate to doing what you do. Um, a lot of compromises that come, come with doing what I, what I do. And when you consider hunting 70, maybe, you know, possibly even more uh, mornings, uh, spring, um it's pretty grueling at times and we just thought i thought you know as as interested as people are in the pictures and uh in what i'm able to gather throughout the year um you know we're gonna try to try to document it through video uh i've got a buddy of mine that uh hunts a lot like i do 
um, and hunts a lot, you know, the same amount I do. And he should finish up his state slam this year um, with a little luck. He's got seven states, I believe, left. Um, so his name uh, is Kenny, and and hopefully Kenny can finish that, and and maybe I'll be there for uh, to document that last state for him, or maybe the last couple of states. I'm not sure about the logistics yet. Um, and then again, he might not want me to be around. You know, it's one of those things. I know when, <laughs> when I finished mine, I had a couple of people like, "Let me come video," and I was like, "Nope." You know what? When it comes to this last thing, I've, I want to do it how I started it. I want to get the back of my truck, sleep out of the back of my truck, and just drive and do it all by myself without any hoopla around it, you know, and that may be what he wants, and if so, uh, so be it. But um, anyways, we're just going to document the whole our whole season. You know, you're talking about 70 or 80, 80 wake-ups, uh, every one of them. We know we get to watch the sunrise, rain or shine. Um, we're just stubborn like that. It's just, just how we're wired when it comes to turkeys. We feel like there's only three months that we're given to do this, and we don't, we don't waste a minute of it. Um, then we hunt a little bit different than what most people turkey hunt. Um, we feel like the way we turkey hunt's kind of almost become a thing of the past. I know a lot of people still still hunt turkeys like we do. It's just not documented very well. Um, you know, we just we, we kind of just hunt turkeys with a shotgun and a mouth yelper or a shotgun and, and, and you know uh, calls. That's kind of the way we do it. And we we like jumping off into the woods. We prefer you know woods turkeys. Um, it's what we like to hunt. Um, and you just don't find a lot of that in, you know, media nowadays when it comes to turkey hunting. Everything seems to have been centered around fields and decoys and, and things and been blind. Um, and if that's the way people like to do it, so be it. But um, that's just not the way we like to do it. And we feel like that way that we like to do it's not very, not illustrated very well. So we just thought we would throw our hat in the ring and see if people might be interested. <laughs> Mm-hmm. How many states are you going to go to this year, Dave? Where's your journey going to take you from Florida on north? Ooh, yeah, I know we'll be spending uh, in fly, obviously Florida, um, Georgia, and Alabama will be where we you know spend a, a bulk of our time. Uh, we'll be in Tennessee. I'll be in <clears> Tennessee for I think about a all depending on success, of course. It could be a couple of days. It could be a week. Who knows? Spending on Tennessee, possibly Kentucky is a pretty good uh, possibility. Going to Illinois for sure. For some reason, I just decided to put in for that tag on a whim. Um, so I got it. I spent the money, so I'll be going up there. Um, going to Maine, uh, I really enjoy Maine uh, because it lets me hunt as late. You know, I go to Florida so I can hunt as early as possible. I'm going to Maine so that I can hunt as late as possible because it'll go into June again this year. Um, Going to take a trip out west. Uh, as of right now, I think we're looking at uh, Washington State and Idaho, possibly Montana, all depending here again on success, uh, where we'll end up th- with that. Um, be nine or ten days out there. You know, we'll probably throw some Hail Marys in there somewhere to hit something else. Um, looking at, I'll have one weekend there where Georgia season closes, and I'll have a have a dead weekend there before I go out to Maine. So I'm, I'll probably, I really like Ohio. Um, and it's still open. That'll be the last week of their season, so I'll probably hit Ohio. But that's just, you know, that's just rough frame framework right now. Sure, I like Ohio too, Dave. <laughs> that's where Zach's yep. from. <laughs> He's sitting sweet, next to sweet. me. Drooling. Yeah, that's some fantastic turkey hunt down in Southern Ohio. Yeah, it's still my fa- it's Southern Ohio is still my favorite to hunt. Dave's favorite. It might be the might be those Florida turkeys. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, my 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 favorite. Uh, whew, yeah, it'd be hard. I'd, I'd like any goblin turkey to be totally yeah, right, right. I I got a quick question for you. I know I, I noticed you said you like hunting turkeys in the timber, in the woods, not field edges, and I feel the same way. Um, and a lot of that has to do with hunting southern Ohio. What would you say is your number one? factor when you're hunting and i know every situation is different but what is your number one uh i guess tip would it be getting better at calling at turkeys in the timber or getting closer to turkeys than you think most people do i guess yeah i I mean obviously calling is a big part of it and and i've spent a lot of time trying to perfect it um but i'll never claim calling is what kills turkeys Mm -hmm. (laughs) i'm not one of those that tells you uh, if you sound exactly like a turkey or no matter how, you know, yes, the more proficient you are, the the more comfortable you are in making calls in specific situations that you'll need to make them. 
but yeah, it's always and always will be location, location, mm-hmm. location. Yep. I mean, if you're in the right spot, it doesn't matter. You don't, you don't, you don't have to call. You know, right. um, I do use an aggressive approach. I like to get as close as possible, hopefully before I even make a sound. Mm-hmm. You know, so I do. I'm aggressive as far as that goes. So yeah, I like woods turkeys. And I like like those rolling hills that allow me to to pinch that you know that gap between he and I. Mm-hmm. Um, that really open terrain, while it's fun to hunt, it can be extremely difficult. I mean, if a turkey can see 200, 250 yards through the timber, that makes it tough to get to, you know, it makes it tough to get to- close to him. So. Right. Yeah. Cool. What do you look for when uh, you are trying to decide to go to a new new area or new state? As far as public land is concerned, and I suppose it goes for public and private land, but what are you really looking for as far as uh, habitat and terrain goes when it when it comes down to scouting these areas from a from a computer at home? Yeah, um, obviously it's all it's all uh, region dependent, I guess. Because certain regions, you know, like I think we've discussed something. You know, it's about that limiting factor. I mean, there's always going to be something that's limited um, that the turkeys are going to kind of be keyed on. In some uh, regions, that's more pronounced than others. Like out, you know, out west, trees are a big thing, so you can really concentrate on creek bottoms that have trees for the turkeys to roost in. If you're out over here in the east, on the east side, I still do like uh, concentration, uh, concentrating around like, you know, watersheds or creeks. Um, I think uh, those, uh, even though it's turkeys and not, you know, they're not. You know, they're not an, not a deer, so they're not funneled, so to speak, but I still think they use those creek bottoms and stuff. Um, when I'm looking at, I really like topo maps. Um, I'll look at um, an area that I can cover a lot of ground and do it efficiently um, without, you know, I like to be able to cover a lot of ground without boogering a lot of turkeys. You know, I like being able to put my ears over a huge amount of area without having to you know, just ramble through it and, and, and kind of mess it all up before I even have a chance to hear them. So I'm always looking for entry points that can get me from point A to point B so I can kind of uh, shift down and, you know, shift shift gears there and slow down and, and kind of prop up against the tree and listen. Um, and then, of course, once it gets daylight, I'm looking for that, you know, a kind of a path of least resistance so I can move and put my ears on more terrain um, that could potentially, you know, have a turkey in it. Um, but I guess to further explain or further kind of uh, go on that same subject is is I'm trying to look for those terrain edges and stuff. Um, I think turkeys key on those same same kind of stuff the deer do a lot of times where you know the food is a lot of times where those those edges meet um, where the sunlight can hit it's where the grass is where the bugs are going to be. Um, we all know the turkeys like to strut where they can be seen. Um, so I key in on that kind of stuff. If I can tell through, through satellite imagery, um, let's see, but, uh, but yeah, I guess that was it. So when I'm looking at satellite imagery, that's kind of the stuff I key on. And I know I said, I, I hunt, you know, I like to hunt woods turkeys and that's my favorite, but if you're hunting terrain that has, you know, that has fields and it's kind of rolling terrain with fields, I mean, you're always a good bet to be within earshot of those field edges because turkeys just love fields. And while I love hunting them in the woods, <laughs> I'd rather hunt them on a field edge where there's turkeys than I had hunt them in the woods where there was no turkeys. Yeah, yeah. amen. I hear you there. And it's it, we're we're kind of similar in the way that we hunt. We especially when we're going out of state and hunting big areas of public land, we're kind of minimalists, I guess you could say. We don't take a lot mm-hmm. with us to the woods and really spend the woodsmanship is the number one thing. Mm-hmm. And absolutely. And like you just said, I think listening to turkeys is something that that people overlook a lot um just being out there at first uh, say for instance you're hunting hind up birds here early in the season which i'm sure you're going to encounter a good many of them throughout the year and mm-hmm. all these different areas that you go to the the thing that we are constantly preaching is find a way to listen and hear those birds when they are most vocal and then you know go from there move on it move in there and start looking for sign on the ground or tracks or scratchings or whatever it is but i like what you just said there about having to or needing to cover a lot of ground so that you can hear those turkeys wherever yeah you know wherever they are that's going to 
pinpoint their location essentially. And that's very important on unfamiliar ground because you can look at satellite imagery for you know until you're blue in the face but until you actually put your boots on the ground you can't be a hundred percent sure. Now if I'm hunting a spot where I know there's turkeys I have you know I have uh, some uh, intel where I have I've been there previously or something then I may slow down. I may not be looking to cover the amount of ground that I would if I had never been there, but um, because I know there there's turkeys there, you know, I'm, I'm very confident that there should be turkeys there, so I'll gear down. But when I'm hunting unfamiliar terrain, I'm willing to walk through a couple of those non-vocal turkeys um, to find one that's vocal mm-hmm. because, you know, um, I'm looking, you know, your, your time is limited a lot of times, you know, when you're on the road. So while it would be fun to spend five days with that gobbler who's, you know, may have a few hens who's not gobbling much, who's only gobbling once every two hours. Those are fun to hunt. But when I'm out of state, I'd almost rather walk through him to find one that's going to be a little bit more cooperative because I'm on a, you know, I'm on a time crunch there. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of the way I approach, you know, it differently. You know, if I've been somewhere before and I know there's bird, I know the habitat's good, and I know, you know, good and well, unless something crazy's changed since I've been there, and I'll definitely approach those areas a little you know, at a lower speed, at a lower gear. We uh, we had a question earlier, Dave, and I think it's a good one. It's it's about taking a gobbler's temperature, and it kind of has to do with how you approach that situation in the woods. When you hear a gobbler, you know, when you're going along and you strike a bird, how do you how do you judge you know when to call, how much to call, what sounds to make? where to set up you might give us some feedback there on on kind of uh what you do in that situation kind of walk us through your thought process yeah um it's kind of with it and with whatever animal uh they don't do anything for no reason it's it's, it's kind of the way I, i put it i've heard it said that they do everything for a reason he's gobbling for some reason um so i try to as soon as i hear him i look at maps and i see where he's at um, and I try to figure out why he's gobbling. Um, if he's just high, if he's on the knob, if he's uh, out into a, in the middle of a field and he's gobbling like a lot, like once a minute or once every two minutes, um, or even you know more rapidly. Um, basically, what that tells me a lot of times is he's by himself and he's looking for company. He's up high so that he can be heard. Um, he's mm-hmm. trying to just like we try to get high so we can hear. He's getting high so he can be heard because he's trying to find, you know, hens. So he's trying to, you know, call up hens. So when I hear him, I'm looking exactly where he's at first. And, and the, uh, you know, I'll, I'll time his gobble. So he gobbled once now. He gobbled, it was seven minutes before he gobbled again. And I'm trying to kind of reason what he's doing and the mood that he's in by that um you know that one example i said if he's he's gobbling a lot and he's up high i'm going to assume that he's looking for a hen and in that situation i'm going to hear again i'm going to use the terrain to get as tight as i possibly can and i'm probably going to wait if he's still gobbling that often i'm going to wait for him to gobble and i'm just going to crawl all over him that's one of those situations where i may be a little bit aggressive with him um act like a hen has kind of slipped in on him and just kind of the way it's supposed to work is he's supposed to gobble, the hens are supposed to yelp, and he's supposed to gobble, and, you know, then she's supposed to come to him. If he's that willing and ready, I let him gobble, and, and then I'll answer him. Like, I'll just crawl right on top of his gobble. Like, his gobble really uh, exci- got, got me excited. If I'm a hen over there and I heard him gobble, ooh, it just, you know, sent chills down my spine. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to crawl right on top of that and let him know that, you know, I'm willing, ready, and a lot of times, that's all you that's all you have to do you know a lot of times that one if he gobbles right back at me then i might crawl right back on him again or i might completely go silent but either either way i'm fixing to i'm fixing to shut it down on him he's fixing to, he's, he knows there's a hen over there and a lot of times he'll come investigate because you know that's that's the frame of mind he was in mm-hmm. if i hear a turkey gobble i'm walking down a you know woods road or something and i hear a turkey gobble and i look and he's down in the bottom um it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for a turkey to be gobbling down in the bottom unless he's already with hens. Hens a lot of times will go down to those bottoms in the hardwoods because that's where a lot of the food is that acorns are and stuff. Hen, a gobbler wouldn't be down there just gobbling, you know, just to gobble to gobble up hens because it doesn't make sense. He can't be heard as far. Um, so in that situation, I'm going to wait and see, 
you know, the repetitiveness of his gobble, he may just be crossing the bottom. He may be searching for a hen, and the next thing you know, you hear him and he's up on top. You know, a lot of the times those turkeys are going from high point to high point trying to find a, find a hen. If that's the case, I'm going to look at the map, and I'm going to try to beat him to the next high point. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if he's down in that bottom and he's only gobbling once every 10 minutes or once every 15 minutes, I'm going to assume that he is following hens around. Um, he's not probably not gobbling with quite the sense of urgency. Um, obviously, he's not gobbling not quite as much. So uh, in that situation, I'm going to assume he's with hen, and I'm going to have to try to get as close as I possibly can. And, you know, they're usually floating one way or another. I don't call it going because hens usually don't move real fast. So it's kind of they'll float up or down, and I'll try to, you know, guess um, which way they're going to go. Uh, if I can get really tight, um, I will call. You know, a lot of people don't, you know, don't, don't try to call to, to end up birds or the birds is following hens. I'm always going to, in the same the same way you can take the gobbler's temperature, you, temperature, you can take a hen's temperature. Mm-hmm. You know, if uh, you just, you know, uh, feed her with a little plain yelps and you get some plain yelps in response, then you can start playing that, uh, you know, that game. If you've got an aggressive hen in there, um, a lot of times that's all you need. Uh, you just stay, you know, you just, con- you know, continue to have that dialogue with her. The next thing you know, she's coming up there for a, you know, to uh, to interact with you, and he's, he's going to be right behind her. Um, if I start calling and I don't get any response, um, then I'm going to assume that she's not a controversial character, that hen is, it, or yeah. with these hens that he's with, and it's going to be do me, you know, it's not going to do me any good to call. It's actually going to do going to hurt me quite a bit to call, because a lot of times the hens, if they're not in a, you know, controversial mood, they'll just, they might as well, they'll just they'll just feed right off and take, take the gobbler right with them. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess that, that hopefully answers the question about taking their temperature. It now, if he's talking about striking a turkey, like not even knowing they're there and coming up, you know, so you walking out of wood road, you decide to stop and, you know, hit a call and the turkey gobbles, um, same situation. I'm always going to look at why the, where the gobble came from and I'm going to put together a plan based on where he's located. If he gobbled from a bottom, I'm going to, my first thought is going to be he's not in that bottom by himself. Um, if he's up on top, he could very well be by himself, or he could very well be with hens, you know. And if I'll – another thing that I have done in the past and really screwed up, because if I screw up, I make sure the next one not, I screw up worse. So I'll, I don't ever learn much from it. So, <laughs> I, uh, um, but is I, I know everybody that's turkey hunting has done this. You're walking down a road, you're bebopping down through there, you slip up to a spot. And you call, and a turkey just rips it, you know, like right out of sight or right out of shotgun range. And you're, and everybody's response is to crash to the ground and, you know, frantically look for a spot. And the next thing you know, you it's three, four, five minutes later, and you're getting all set up. Um, then they don't ever see the, or hear the turkey again, and it, it kind of, you know, I, thought, I found that it really helped to slow those type of situations down. Um, because you have more time than you think you have. Uh, it doesn't take long to, to pick a tree and sit down. Keep clucking to that turkey or something, because if you just struck him and you're that close to him, he doesn't expect to gobble at that hen and her go completely silent and crash into the nearest bush, you know? Right. Um, yeah. So all of that sounds unnatural to him. <laughs> I have found uh, a lot of success with when he hammers it and he's that close, just keep go- uh, keep clucking or, or uh, even cut at him. Or, or do some light yelps, like keep it as if what basically react like a hen's going to react. If a hen's coming down through there looking for a gobbler, which is exactly why she would be cutting or yelping, um, and he gobbles, that's going to, you know, that's going to ruffle her feathers. I mean, she she likes that. So the next thing, she's she's not going to shut up. She's going to respond right back to him. So I have uh, found success by just keep clucking while I'm getting ready or or whatever, um, uh, and um, you know, find obviously you. The best recipe is to have the tree already picked out before you make the call so that you can crash right into something that you've already kind of had an eyeball at. Yeah. But um, mm-hmm. but either way, just try to make it realistic. you gotta, you got to kind of slow down and realize what what's happening for them every single day. You know, yeah, a hen it. calls to get a response from a gobbler, and when he responds, it, she's, that's what she was looking for, buddy. She's excited, so she's going <laughs> to call right back to him. Mm-hmm. It's unnatural for him to gobble at her and her just to – 
completely go silent for five minutes. That's so, a real good point. I hadn't yeah. really thought about that before. That's that makes a lot of sense. I like the I like the point that you made about having a spot before you even make that call yeah. picked out. You know, I I made this. We all have, and I still I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna do it again. We've all made that mistake, and we'll do it again. But one thing I learned when I was a teenager was just have the tree picked at least something close, at least have an idea. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good point that you made. And, and, you know, the calling thing, continuing to call is just one step above that. I guess mm -hmm. I that's something I don't do, but I do try to pick a tree. So, yeah, great points. Just want to welcome Scott and Dayton and Greg. Just seeing these guys uh, popping in, joining along uh, for everybody that's just joined. Feel free to ask Dave uh, and us some questions as we're going along here. We'll try to get to them during the podcast. Dave, we just got a question from Joshua. He's asking, where do you go on a windy day with little to no gobbling? Uh, <clears throat> windy days, um, that's my least favorite day to turkey hunt. I'd rather be <laughs> down for rain than windy. Um, but uh, – you can look turkeys get out of the wind just like we get out of the wind they're going to get to those leeward side of the mountains or leeward side of the hills or deep deeper ravines um and they will get they will get to those if, so if you are familiar with the area and you uh have you know walked walked up a bottom or something before a creek bottom or something and there was some scratching in there some tracks in the sand or something be a good place to start because those turkeys are going to target those kind of areas um, if you're in big rolling, uh, you've got huge fields like out, the, you know, out out west and stuff. Those turkeys will will utilize the smallest little depression. I mean, you won't even be able to hardly tell that it's a depression. And I've done this, you know, windy, you know, blowing the hat off your head. And you look out there, and there's a flock of turkeys out there, and you look at them from the road, and you're like, man, they're just standing right out in the middle of that field. You can see the feathers kind of getting flown up and stuff. And you're like, why are they there? Then you go to try to get up on them or crawl up on them or something and you figure out that once you get out there there's a little dip that may just be you know the six foot elevation difference and they're they're utilizing that little dip um so they will utilize any little bitty you know break in the terrain and they'll definitely utilize cover i mean these evergreen trees and stuff they do break a lot of the wind and i found that uh those turkeys know where those little pockets are that'll uh that uh that'll break that wind for them um and another thing is turkeys will be nervous in the in the wind, um, but that don't mean they're not still gobbling or not still talking. A lot of times that just means we can't hear them. Um, so call, I won't say I call louder, but I'll probably say I call more often um, because I'm always afraid that if a turkey has, I'm afraid they're going to hear me before I hear them, basically, and I'm going to try to provoke a response for, from him before he gets in the time that I can see him and he can see me. Uh, so I call a little bit more often if I'm just kind of uh, moving. Um, instead of going, you know, 100 yards between calling six sequences, I may, go, may, may walk 50 if I'm doing a little walking, which is another thing. You really want to slow everything down when you're when it's windy, um, because uh, you know you just flat out can't hear. And he could have he could have heard Jimmy coming to you. Um, so I kind of here again it's one of those one of those situations. I'll put it in granny gear and I'll just kind of creep more than I will kind of try to cover a lot of a lot of terrain. That's a good point. Hey, before we get too far ahead, we got lots of questions here we want to get to, but I want to do a uh, quick little piece on your run that you had last weekend. Dave just yep. won the 2018 NWTF Grand National Calling Competition. And for those of you that don't know, it is extremely hard to do that. <laughs> um, you've got to be the best turkey caller in the world in order to do that. And I was watching this thing live on NWTF's live stream. And when I heard your run, Dave, I, I looked at my buddies. We were all listening to it, watching it. And I said, that's the best turkey calling that I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> like, and I've been, I mean, you guys know I've been doing this stuff since I was like, yeah. you know, for 20 years. Mm -hmm. I've been in the competitive turkey calling realm. Never was successful, really, mm -hmm. to speak of. But I know what these guys sound like and mm -hmm. this was the best turkey call i've ever heard and i want uh greg's gonna play your uh, one of your scenarios here dave and uh as we're going through that scenario we'll pause it every once in a while and i want you to tell the the listeners and the viewers what kind of sounds you're making and what that hen is doing in that instance and then maybe okay. even talk about when you use that type of call in the woods 
Sure, sure. All right, Greg, fire him up. Pause that quick, Greg. Dave, you might kind of walk people through the first part of that scenario on what you're doing there, what you're trying to mimic. Yeah. Um, well, the scenario they're they're given to us before we ever walk out on the stage, and what we're what we're basically kind of uh, trying to replicate or or you know sound out, I guess, is a and it was a hen waking up on a limb, uh, flying down in a field and begin feeding. Um, so what you hear first is essentially what, or what I was trying to pull off, and hopefully did it well, was, um, you know, when, when a turkey wakes up, it's just breaking daylight, and they're, you know, they're extremely still, you know, they're sleepy, they're on the limb, they're all still squatted down, head tucked tight, and they'll do those little muffled, uh, little muffled like teardrop, or people call them bubble plucks, um, on the limb. Uh, that's the real, real like, uh, you know, the hollow sounding plug i guess and then uh, a lot of times that's followed by the real uh real muffled uh, uh sleepy sounding yelps and that's kind of them uh, kind of checking you know making sure everybody's still where you know where where they're still having moved from the morning you know the night before um so they're extremely uh muted sounding um and that's what you hear um, and as, uh, of course, we're trying to play all this out in a in a three minute scenario. We're given three minutes to pull this off, so everything's a little bit, you know, quicker than it would be in real life. But um, uh, then, you know, as it gets a little bit more daylight, and they talk back and forth with those muffled yelps a little bit, you'll get, you know, one a turkey that gets a little more aggressive. You know, she's, uh, you know, getting ready, getting a little bit closer to. She can see a little better, getting a little bit closer. Maybe one of the hens, you know, it seems like they sort out a sort out their pecking order about every dog on day. As soon as they get the ground, they got to get that sorted out again, like they didn't do it the day before. But um, so when you know when they start, they they'll, they'll one will get a little bit aggressive and, and bring the volume up, and you can hear a little bit of that throatiness, that rasp um, uh, comes into there. Um, and then you try to mimic a little bit of nervousness, uh, as you can tell, as it gets closer to the fly down cackle. Um, the club got a little bit more nervous and inquisitive, I guess, um, so that it shows that, you know, flying down, I, it seems to me, is, is a big deal for the turkeys. They're always extremely nervous. As soon as they hit the ground, they hit the ground. The first thing they do is their head goes straight up and they're looking. Um, they're never 100% sure what's on the ground until they get there, it seems like. Um, so I get that. That's why I start doing that, you know, a little bit more of an uneasy, uh, you know, uh, nervous kind of a, a yelping, and uh, the clucking gets a little bit more rapid, and then it's more of like a just a she's yelping, yelping, and there's kind of like a spontaneous, you know, she comes up off the limb and tries to blast off the limb, and, and it's kind of a a little bit of a climbing cackle those first few uh, wing beats, and says she's busting off the limb, and as she's going down. You know, a lot of times I've found that they have to dodge a limb or something, and that's where they'll do that little stutter that <laughs> instead of just a just a solid, you know, cackle straight to the floor. And so that's what I was trying to trying to pull off there. And you and you mimic that in the woods a lot when you're when you're hunting turkeys as well. If you can be low, uh, if you can be lucky enough to roost a turkey um, and get close enough to him to use that super soft stuff, then yeah, I mean it's it's deadly. Um, you know, if you get, you know, you can, you can slip in tight enough to one on the roost where he can hear that muted stuff. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it, it, it's very deadly. I, I, I'm, I'm, a lot of people don't call the turkeys on the limb. I do. Um, 
I like to get him turned my way on the limb because I have found turkeys can cover, you know, a lot of ground when they when they fly off the tree. And if he just so happens to be pointed the wrong way, he's going to cover 50 or 60 or 70 yards possibly in the wrong direction. <laughs> so I like to let him know I'm there. Uh, maybe not with much. You can sometimes just do that with those little muted clucks. You know, if you do that and he fires back at it, then he knows you're there. And, you, and if he's going to turn around on the limb and face you, then then he's going to do it with with knowing that you're there. You're not going to be able to convince him otherwise with you know a bunch of a bunch of racket that could potentially uh, give up your position too much or something or or you know ruin the whole gig. Um, the tackle, I do. I mean, you can use it. I don't use it much. Uh, I just don't find it very – I find that, you know, eight out of ten hens are not going to cackle. And when I'm out there, I'm trying to be as realistic as possible. Um, the only time I cackle is if I have gotten into a bickering match with a pile of hen turkeys. Like if I have slipped into a flock of turkeys and I've got that old ball ten really mm-hmm. aggravated on the limb, and sometimes I'll cackle um, to, uh, you know, just to add more, you know, fire to the fury, I guess. Uh, to see if I can, you know, you're, at that point you're trying to convince her. It's just not any, got anything to do with the gobbler. It's all about calling her to you. If you can get her to you, you probably got the, you, you'll steal the deal. Um, I, I just don't use a cackle a whole lot. Um, I, I, I do use a wing a lot, symbolize to, to uh, you know, to imitate a, a hen flying down. But I just find doing the muted stuff. And then the wing is more realistic to me because, like I said, eight out of hen, eight out of ten hens seem to seem to fly down without without cackling. So now we're gonna we're gonna play the rest of that scenario out quick, and and uh, for everybody to know before we get into the second half of this scenario here at Dave's at on stage at the Grand Nationals last weekend, um, he's getting ready to mimic a hen that has just hit the ground. He's just flown down. And he's trying to mimic a hen turkey that is, or a group of hen turkeys that have just hit the ground. It's the first thing of the morning once they fly down. Go ahead and play it, Greg. <laughs> you maybe got the bird in uh, Greg's back room talking. <laughs> you had to throw that little key key in there, key in, didn't you? I was I was turned into a time when I was running towards the computer for a minute there. <laughs> Let them know what that's all about, there, Dave. I mean, that's pure turkey to me, but um. yeah. Uh, well, I mean, she's supposed to fly down in the field and, and just begin feeding. Uh, they wanted some plain yelps in there. So, uh, essentially, I just, you know, the hen hit the ground, and like I said, they're always nervous, in my opinion, when they hit the ground, so they don't immediately start, you know, yelping and, and carrying on, uh, especially when they're, you know, only a couple of them or just one by herself. 
Um, so that's why I do kind of a lot of those like almost inquisitive clucks when she hits the ground because I just imagine that hen hitting the ground and she's up on her tippy toes almost. You know, she's surveying the landscape. She's seeing what is going on and what is here that's going to try to eat me because I feel like that's what is going through a turkey's head all the time is what is around that next a being that's going to try to eat me. So I do that first, and then as she calms down, I start doing those little single note yelps. Um, that's you know the most one of the most used turkey uh, uh, pieces of turkey language that I think underused. I don't hear near as many people uh, in hunting or, or whatever it may be doing single yelps or double yelps. I just don't hear it enough. Um, so that's what I started with, like her, you know, calming down and getting a little more calm. And as she starts kind of moving from point A to point B to try to find some some cohorts, cohorts to hang with that day. Um, that's when I got, you know, a little bit more volume to the yelp because she's starting to, you know, she's starting to look for, for somebody to hang with. Um, I did some, like, a little under the breath yelps. I feel like is uh, it's something that the turkeys do just in their day-to-day thing. They'll yelp, um, and then uh, it's almost like they get distracted by something. I've seen them, they're yelping, and they'll see a, you know, they'll go for a bug or they'll pick a seed or something, and they continue to yelp, but it's like the the shape of their their throat kind of changes as they as they kneel down or they they reach over to get that so their yelp changes it'll go from clear with the, with some rasp uh, to something under the breath because they're you know they're they've got something in their mouth whether it be a cricket or whatever it is uh, um so that's why I kind of change those yelps up um, like she's you know she's she's moving um she's not stationary I was gonna um, say that's turkey. exactly what I thought it sounded like you know after say there's a group of hens in the tree roosted and you have about half of them fly down well once a group of them gets on the ground you know that first one what may wait there nervously but once a group of them get on mm-hmm. the ground they all start to peck around and start feeding yep and that's what that yep. yelp reminded me of was you know just that group of turkeys kind of calling back to one another almost kind of half muffled you know like you were like yep. you were doing there yeah that's what i'm that's what i was trying to trying to pull off and, and you always try to you always try to uh, put together a scenario that the judges will be able to interpret interpret easily, um, but have it spiced up enough to where, you know, it's really just, you know, it's like, ooh, you know, that was turkey. I've heard that before. So, um, and so, yeah, that's what that was. And then, of course, I threw in some, some yelps. Kind of sounded like she, you know, may have found another, you know, may have found another hen that's yelping softly back to her, and then they kind of get together. Um, and then once they're together, like you said, once a couple of them seem to seem to ma- match up, um, they'll, you know, uh, relax a bit, and that's when they can start feeding. And really, that's when you really start hearing all those, you know, just that that just gravelly, like pure turkey stuff, like the, all the, you know, the purrs. Um, I think truly, truly relaxed turkeys. Um, they they you know they have a higher pitched purr. Um, I think uh, a lot of purring is a little bit deeper and louder than it than it uh, because everybody that hears purrs has usually been been listening to a turkey that's provoked, and a turkey that provokes always comes in with that a little bit a purr that's a little bit more aggressive. Um, but uh, turkeys that are not provoked seem to have that really bubbly, high pitched purr, uh, the one that I like to listen to anyways, and when I try to replicate, and um, and they always have those little muted. Uh, I don't know if they're wine. They have the feeding whistles in there, of course. You always hear that, and uh, you'll always have that that turkey that'll you know throw a little two note key or something in there, and those little muted, uh, you know, not really a single note yelp, but you hear them, you know, doing those little under the breath yelps all the time. It's like they're never quiet when they're in a group. You know, there's always always something going on, and that's just you know, it's hard to do that on one call. But I I, I try my best to. to to throw it all, you know, when you're on that stage, buddy, you better throw the kitchen sink. You better make sure when you leave, there ain't, there is nothing left. So, what I was trying to do. Well, it sounded really good. The yeah. NWTF did a did a heck of a job with that, um, putting that live stream together this year. Uh, yeah, you know that was that, was, that cool. was really cool for everybody at home to even be able to watch it. You know, as it unfolded, that was super neat of them to do that. Yep. and. Uh, you know, if you're not already a member of the NWTF, anybody that's out there listening right now, seriously think about becoming part of that organization because they are the reason why we have turkeys to hunt and why, you know, guys like Dave are traveling around to 49 states and, and killing birds and, 
you know, and, and producing these awesome calls and stuff. I saw a question a while ago we had that asked if you, uh, if you made your own calls for these contests. Yeah, I've got my own press, so yeah, I make my own, uh, make my own mouth yelpers. That's something I started doing. I actually only started doing it probably, I guess, three years ago. Yeah. I got a press. Uh, I had a little hand jig that I did for a couple years before that and wanted something a little more exact. I wanted to gauge, you know, to tell exactly what tension. Um, but I started building my own calls, and that's when you can really, really start tinkering with stuff, you know. You can really start tinkering and, and seeing what material does what and what, you know, just a little bit more stretch will do or a little less stretch, and that's when you can really, you know, get some unique sounds and fine-tune what works for you, you know, and it's, it's so unique for each person, you know. Um, majority of the people that I know, I can make them a call just like I blow, um, and they can't make a noise with it. I mean, it, it's not something that's easy for them to use. Um, so it's, you know, it's it's so unique. I mean, it's like a, you know, it's like a pair of prescription, you know, glasses. I mean, it's going to be exact for whatever person, however they deliver air, and there's no way to know of that until you until you start trying it. Sure. Well, let's get into some a bunch of these questions, Brody. Let's uh, start firing them off here. What do you got? Uh, do you use the Kiki Run much, and if so, in what situations? Um, it can be useful. I won't say I use it much. Um, I, ha I I do use it sometimes if, if you're if you're going toward that uh you got that gobbler with hens. I have had success with it. Um, you know, if, if that hen's not being very receptive to, a, you know, you yelp at her and she just, especially if you can put your eyes on her um, and you can tell it's a young hen or if you can't and you can just tell uh, that they're moving off still uh, and you and you know that these got hens, you can always try a key because it is kind of a lost turkey. That's what it represents is a, is a bird trying to find the flock. Um, sometimes you can appeal to that maternal instinct of a hen and get her to venture your way. Um, it can be really effective also, I found, uh, with jakes. Um, and that sounds a little weird, but if you've got jakes that are surrounding a gobbler, and I found that to be the case several times, sometimes jakes, they're, you know, they're a, this year's turkey. They're still a young turkey. It's a lot of times they will respond to a kiki. Um, and uh, especially if you can pair that with like another jake, like a jake yelp or a, a deep coarse yelp, um, they're, you know, they're curious little boogers. And a lot of times, um, if they're with a gobbler, if you can call the jakes to you, the gobbler's aggression gets the best of him, and he's afraid that those jakes are fixing to stumble up on a hen over there that he doesn't have already. So he will, a lot of times, they'll drift off from him and head head towards you, and, and you'll, next thing you know, he'll be picking up the ground because he wants to make sure that he's not missing out on something because they're they're jealous it seems like a lot of times and they don't want those jakes to, to get the upper hand on them so i have had success doing that as well with it with a kiki what's the best you advice you could give somebody that's uh new to turkey calling and uh and that's trying to, or that's trying to up their game with turkey calling a little bit right now we're in that time frame when people are starting to dust off their calls they're starting to get mm -hmm. them out and do a lot of practicing and what you see over and over is this is when a lot of those bad habits start to come in, you know, from, yeah, absolutely. from just practicing in the basement or whatever. And uh, what uh, what's some tips you could give folks to maybe remedy that if they're just getting into turkey calling? If you're just getting into it, it's, it's definitely finding the right call. Uh, like I was saying earlier, everybody delivers air a little differently. Um, there's several good, you know, instructionals on YouTube and stuff like that to where it can really get you – um, you know, delivering the air from your diaphragm instead of your cheeks and that kind of thing, getting those fundamentals down, um, then it's going to be matching yourself up with the right call. Um, some of us deliver air right across the center uh, uh, of our palate, and some of us deliver air off to one side. Um, uh, then, you know, once you get that, you can match it up to what sound you like. Everybody doesn't like the, the same sound. Um, you know, some people like a lot of rat. Some pe people like it you know, like a more of a clear sound. Um, so it's going to be kind of a trial and error in uh, picking out a hen, you know, picking out a hen that you like. Uh, get on YouTube, there's a pile of, of audio hens. Pick out one that you like the, that like the sound of, and then get a couple calls, get get those different uh, cuts that I just mentioned. Like you can get the combo cuts, 
to where they have a gap out of one side. You can get a reverse combo to where the gap's out of the other side. Um, you can get a ghost cut or a split V to where the, the, the gap is uh, in the latex, that top read is straight over the center. Um, and those gaps is where you get the, the high pitch, the clean, the cleanliness of the, of the front of the yelp from. And uh, picking out, you know, try a couple of those calls, and you can figure out real quickly which, you know, which one's going to be the most appealing to your ear is going to get you, you know, and a lot of that's got to do with how you deliver air, and you'll quickly figure it out when you, when you use those calls. Um, get yourself matched up with a call, uh, and different call companies stretch their calls at different tensions. Um, so once you find the cut that you think, think fits you best, um, maybe uh, try a couple different call companies with that, you know, that cut. Uh, maybe different latex on the top, you know, some of them they'll be 4,000th on top, you know, uh, the thickness of the latex, some of it will be thicker. So um, then you can toy around, you know, you've got it kind of narrowed down to what cut fits you best, and then you can get a couple different manufacturers, and therefore you get a couple different tensions and um, see which one of those fits you best. You're just kind of narrowing it down, you know, to what's going what's gonna to be uh, most beneficial for you. And then it's just practice. It gets down to just just running it. Um, you know, you hear practice makes perfect, and, and, and until you get to the extreme uh, ends of that, I think that that can be true for turkey calling as well. Um, you know, you talked about bad habits. Yeah, there's bad habits, but I feel like those bad habits don't come in until you've really, really done a lot of turkey calling. Uh, like me, myself, um, I don't do a lot of practicing uh, when it comes to these competitions and stuff. If I've got good calls, um, then I'll set those bad boys down, and I won't mess with them, and I won't call a lot because I've found that the more I call, the more likely I am to, you know, like you said, I'll pick up a bad habit. And the next thing you know, you know, I'm, I'm really I'm really doing something bad here that I can't seem to get my get through my thick skull on how to correct it. So, um, but for the for the ordinary guy who hasn't called a whole lot. Um, I think uh, I think just finding that cut, finding finding a call that you're comfortable with, and just practicing. I mean, um, you know, practice enough to where you, you can get comfortable in, in replicating, um, you know, whatever call you you want to replicate, whether it be clucks or yelps, aggressive yelps. You want to cut cut aggressively. Um, confidence is the biggest thing. It's not as much the sound as being able to to make the right call at the right time. Um, and then here again, just remember, calling is just a very small piece of the turkey hunting puzzle. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't have to be a grand national champion to kill turkeys. You don't even have to be close. Yeah. Um, so that's just a very small piece when it comes to when it comes to actually actually killing them. Kind of leads to a question that I have. I've been turkey hunting my whole life, but I definitely don't think I'm the best caller. I think one thing that helps me, and I, I guess I don't know if this is something that you would get, give. Uh, a tip of uh, sometimes it's not about me practicing I know how to run the calls that I like it's just a matter of listening to hens you know like just get on YouTube mm-hmm. as I'm going to sleep and just listen to hens talk you know I, do, was that something that you would recommend to maybe somebody who's I guess in the same position as me that doesn't necessarily feel like they're the best caller but average yeah I mean just I guess yeah I mean from a different standpoint as yeah, rather than you a can beginner. listen to the hens to- yeah, you can get you can you can listen to the hens to get the sound. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that I think people they botch up a little bit because you can listen to them all day long and get the sound and get what a yelp is supposed to sound like or what cutting is supposed to sound like the rhythms the cadences you can get that. But um, it really helps if you can have video as well right. because I have found that you can interpret just like a person when they're talking. Um, you can read their body language and you can almost, they can, you can, you know, the TV can be muted and you can just see that their mouth is moving. You can read their body language and tell what they're saying. Right. Same way with turkeys. I think you can interpret what that turkey's mood is without, you know, actually knowing if she's cutting or if she's yelping or what she's doing. So, um, it really helps to determine, you know, what what she's trying to say or what she's trying to get across by watching her body language as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that really helps. And then when you hear it and when you're out there hunting and you hear it, you can almost visualize what she's doing. Like, Mm -hmm. is she yelping 
in aggression? Can you hear that aggression in her voice, or um, is she just uh, is she alone? Is she alone and just cruising and looking for companionship, or you know, it really helps to to be able to uh, to interpret the sounds more uh, just as much. I think it's just as important to being able to interpret those sounds that is, as it is to just to be able to replicate them and know what they sound like. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, and for example, like uh, there's there's multiple types of cutting that you'll hear hens doing in the woods. To his point, what he's talking about is like if a hen is just walking and she's cutting sporadically, you know, pop, 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 like that through the woods, she's looking for other turkeys right. when she's walking mm-hmm. like that. But then a lot of the cutting that you hear these guys doing on stage whenever they ask them to do like the cutting of the excited hen or whatever, they're doing that really, really fast, choppy, you know, excited cutting, and you'll see a hen, you know, get up on her tippy toes when you're actually watching mm-hmm. her. She'll raise up on her toes, and she'll just really use that, you know, her mm-hmm. her diaphragm, you know, to pump those cuts out. Right. And that's trying to get those other turkeys' attention, mm-hmm. you know. So it's just like... And that's usually point. aggression. And that's usually aggression. She's usually responding to something yep. when she does that. And, and from, from my experience, she's usually responding like she's been cutting. She's mad or, or something. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. How many times have you came up to a ridge top or whatever to try to strike a turkey and you and buddy, as soon as it gets down the hill, buddy, she climbs all over it. I mean, that's when you hear that. That's when you hear that. That. that like she is not happy that you are in her area. And she's usually and, coming uh, when you do that. Yeah. Oh yeah, a lot of times you need to you need to you need to be looking for a spot to to hide. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times, a lot you know, in, in these scenarios, uh, or or even in uh, what we're asked for is is uh, cutting in, in response to an intruding hen or something. They try to give us that that to to play out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that you know the point that you made is is always kind of what as a guy, what like like I've hunted with Aaron now for a couple of years, and he's way better at the the calling than I am altogether but our strategy goes together so we we hunt well together but yeah it's always been for me just getting close he's to got the, the sounds and you've got the look <laughs> <laughs> I got the hair you know so we, we, you know it's it's my strategy has always been get close and then just you know have the right type of call you know that that want that want to do it but yeah it's it's just I'm always I'm always trying to improve as well even from you know, a guy who's, I don't know, been hunting a long time, so it's... Uh, yeah, there's always room for improvement on oh, yeah. who you are. I've, I've, I've done it for, you know, done it and done it a lot in, in, in every year. If you're not learning something, you're doing something wrong, yeah. you know? Um, That's right. And like I said earlier, I'm the number one. I mean, one thing I do do well is I, I learn from every mistake I make because the next one I make is usually bigger and worse. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I like that rule as well. <laughs> We better get to some more of these questions, Brody. What do you got? Let's rattle off some of them here. What advice would you give a deer hunter that is wanting to get into turkeys? Um, <laughs> the deer hunters wanting to get into turkeys, uh, <laughs> forget a lot of what you know about deer hunting. <laughs> uh, because I do see a lot of deer hunters that get into turkey hunting and they, they go after turkeys just like they go after deer and while you can see some success with that you know you can see some success from sitting on food plots or you know uh waiting them out at you know at crossings or something um it's not the most enjoyable way to hunt turkeys and that you're really cutting yourself short if you do that um so if if, if a deer hunter is wanting to go turkey hunting the first thing i i would i would say is, is learn the language like we just spoke about because uh that's the biggest difference in turkey hunting and deer hunting is you get to interact with those those turkeys so much more than deer. Mm-hmm. Um, it's that conversation. Uh, so learn a little bit about it so that you can you can uh, interact with them and you'll enjoy it so much more. The thing is, you can go out there and kill a turkey by yeah. you know if you're a deer hunter, you have the equipment most likely, and you have a piece of you have a piece of ground. You can go find scratch and you can hunt them just like you hunt deer. Um, I just don't want you to sell yourself short yeah. mm-hmm. and go out there and, and deer hunt a turkey essentially and, and, and be like, that wasn't that cool. <laughs> you know, I did all this yeah. and I've got a 20 pound gobbler where I could have done this and have a 200 pound deer. Uh, you know, it's just, it's not what it, what I thought it was going to be to where, 
if you'd have truly experienced a turkey hunt, how I visualize a turkey hunt should go down, and you have that interaction, and you have that that ground pounding, you know, gobbling and drumming, and the whole strategy that plays out. Uh, strategy with turkeys can can a lot of times go down in one day, which I like mm-hmm. when compared to deer hunting. A lot of times, you know, you you strategizing on some of these bucks and trying to trying to uh, to capitalize on their weaknesses during the rut or, or wind thermals or uh, wind direction and food source and all this, that can take months to, to plan out where with a turkey, you can strike that turkey and do all of that reasoning that we were talking about early hmm. earlier and, and put together a plan and see it come to success or failure, you know, just in a few hours. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I guess to shorten this up or I guess to summarize, if I was a fewer deer hunter, you'd say, what do I need to do to turkey hunt? First, get on YouTube, watch hen footage, watch the interactions with hens and gobblers. I hesitate to say watch turkey hunting because it, True. it's gotten to where a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that's available is going to kind of steer you in the wrong direction, which is another reason we've kind of kind of try going to try to um, kind of try to put something different out there for you, to, to, so that you can get more of that interaction, the, the vocal type interaction. And um, be ready for for that when you go out there, and go out there with the intentions on on having the hunt go down like that. Uh, that way, when you're successful, um, it'll be something that that really drives you, and uh, and you'll really want to go do it again. What else you got, Brody? Uh, explain when you use a decoy and when you don't use a decoy. I don't even know if Dave <laughs> uses decoys. <laughs> I don't. I have before. I've killed a turkey in about every way you can possibly kill one. So I'm not a. You know, I'm not. I'm not. If it's legal, by all means, if it gets you outside, then go do it. Um, so I'm not going to talk down to anyone. Uh, you know, for using a decoy, it's just not my style. Um, they can be very effective, almost too effective, in my opinion. That's why I don't. You know, that's why I've, I've kind of shied away from them because. I don't like the way it changes the it changes the game. Really, I don't like the way decoys change the game. Um, I like the uh, the one on one, and I kind of feel like I'm I'm cheating him if I if I use a decoy. Um, a lot of people will will balk at that, and they they feel completely different, um, and that's completely fine. I'm not asking you to hunt like I hunt, um, but just the fashion that I like to hunt turkeys is is I want to I want to kill him with what's between my ears, and that's all I want to kill him with. Um, I'm not a traditionalist by any means. I'm, you know, I use a 20 gauge shotgun with TSS and, you know, and in modern camouflage and whatnot. But, um, but you know, that's just the way I, the way I enjoy hunting. And it's gotten to a point now to where, um, I just, I just don't use decoys. Don't even, don't even own one. So, <laughs> a lot of folks are commenting about uh, the red shirt. Uh, stuff. What it, I, I I guess I didn't really know what was going on, but I heard somebody tell me the other day, you, were you wearing just a red shirt in the preliminaries or something? Yeah, in the in the head to head in the prelims, I just had on a red, you know, just a red t shirt, and uh, actually I thought it was orange, um, but on in the on the live feed it showed up red, and everybody was it was was uh, commenting on red shirt that they like the way red shirt sound, and I was like, hey. <laughs> You know, that way when I get my tail beat, at least I know some somebody liked it. So I, I was, <laughs> yeah. I was, that was cool. Well, then you went into the finals and you're wearing that white shirt, and I was watching the live feed there at NWTF's Facebook, and I st- started seeing Good hashtag, ladies and gentlemen, hashtag and white the shirt of- the whole time, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, that, that live feed was really cool. It was really, really cool. Because we were, you know, not during the finals, like, we can't watch – Right. Before you, before you, you know, go on the stage, you can't watch it anyways. But, uh, but like during the, uh, during the friction and stuff, we were, we were watching the the stuff around back and and uh, that live feed, buddy. It was it was it was really cool. Yeah, they did a heck of a cool job with it. I thought that was I thought that was pretty funny watching everybody comment on there saying yeah. go white shirt you know I thought that was <laughs> I liked it that was pretty cool and that says <laughs> that says a lot about Dave you know like I was telling you guys a while ago Dave is a is a turkey guy mm-hmm. like he he thinks about these things all year like we think about Absolutely. deer you know for five or six months and we Some think rabbits. about turkeys for four or five <laughs> months and squirrels yeah all about five. <laughs> Dave thinks about turkeys all year. Like, and he listens yeah. <laughs> to these things all the time. So 
when he when, when he went up to this contest, you know, it's it's uh, pretty interesting to watch him and watch everyone's you know reaction when he called like that. You know, I'm not surprised that you called like that because of all the turkeys that you've listened to over the years. You know, that's that's just uh, part of the part of the whole game. But yeah, was, that's just that's just what I do. You know, I I hunt deer. Uh, I bow hunt deer. Uh, deer and deer, you know, deer in the deer season. Um, I just, uh, turkeys are my thing, and I'm not willing to sacrifice any of vacation time or uh, a whole lot of finances or anything that's going to potentially take from my from my, my turkey type, you know, my turkey stuff. So uh, turkeys are what I do. It's just, <clears throat> I wish it could be under any other way because it's honestly influenced every decision I've made in life since I was, you know, old enough to make <laughs> you know, good decisions. and bad decisions. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it's influenced my my whole life at this point and, and it's got me where I'm at. Uh, some people will say that's a good spot. Some people will say not so good. <laughs> we think it's cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, one more question here. What's your go-to call or calling uh, scenario or whatever for a hung-up bird? Nathan's asking uh, If he's that. hung up, <clears throat> if he knows where I'm at, um... I'm, basically, what I do is make sure he knows where I'm at, and I put the ball in his court. I let him make the next move. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if there's, I mean, if he's hung up, you, you, you're obviously, I'm assuming you don't know what he's hung up on, or if in, even if there is a terrain feature that he's hung up on, if he's just out there gobbling and you're, you're not sure why, um, there's so many things that could be could be going on. He could have a in that's feeding in a field and he's not going to leave her and he may sit there and gobble um with no, with no intentions of ever leaving her and you can wait her out and see where she goes um if the terrain will you know if the terrain will let you you know if you can't call them crawl them i mean <laughs> i'm not above if, if you if anybody says calling a turkey is just just wrong i'm not you know i'm not I'm not in that. I'm not in that class yet. I don't get it. <laughs> if you can fool the eyes of a wild turkey, then buddy, you have really done something. Yeah. So if you can use the terrain feature to close that distance, um, especially if he's gobbling a lot and let you know where he's at, you know, and you can really pin him down. Um, and then there's always the option of Plan B, which is setting up on him from a different angle. That way, if there is a terrain feature between you, uh, maybe if you get around to you know his, you know, nine o'clock or something, maybe there won't be. A, uh, a terrain feature, uh, you know, you've got to be where they want to be. Um, they're not going to be, they're not going to go somewhere they don't want to go. Um, so they may respond to you because they like what you're saying and they would really like to be close to you or what they think, like to be close to what they think is sitting up against the tree or, or over there walking around in the woods. But, um, you know, moving <clears throat> is, a, is, a, is another good tactic um, and moving while you're calling even. You know, if you're working a bird, you just got to think. You just got to think like a turkey. Like, what is he used to hearing? A hen, like I said earlier, they're very seldom sitting still. So when you go sit up beside this tree and you're sitting there for a solid hour calling to him and you haven't moved, I mean, these turkeys, they can hear they can hear a hen yelp and they know where that thing is, I mean, within feet. I mean, I've called the turkeys from trees 200 yards away and had them walk up to the tree and stare at the base of it. I mean, they can tell. I mean, they live in those woods. So if you're sitting up there and he's out there and you're you're sitting beside that tree and you're not moving, he can tell that. And that's just not realistic. Um, so if if you're if you have the cover and it and you have the ability to, I I found that it's good to, you know, move even if it's just ten yards, you know, just moving like a hen would move and calling and turning your head like a hen would call. I mean I've found that a lot of times that'll break turkeys because it's not something they've heard before all right bro is there any more that we need to get to oh there's some if you want let's uh let's ask him let's ask him a couple more and then we probably better wrap this up greg's greg's hollering at me back there with his sign (laughs) (laughs) do you ever gobble and if so in what situations um i don't gobble much i always do carry a tube call that I have the ability to gobble on. Uh, I hunt a ton of public ground, and while I'm not a nervous person, gobbling is kind of, you're running on that borderline of being a little bit crazy to do it, not that I haven't done it, but uh, 
if I am going to use a gobble, it's going to be in, a, in an aggressive situation. A lot of times early season, if you've ever been out there a lot during the early season, you'll hear these turkeys gobble, start gobbling on the roost. <clears throat> and if you can get between them, usually you've sealed the deal. Because the first, like I said earlier, a lot of times turkeys, seems like every single morning their feet hit the ground, they have to get that pecking order settled back out again. Um, I don't know why. It seems like the, you know, it seems like the, the, the top man on the totem pole would be the top man every day, but it's like, I don't know if he loses his confidence or the other guy gets his chest, you know, gets his chest uh, poked out a little bit too far in the mornings or something. I don't know, but they have to sort things out. So if you get between them, I found it's been extremely effective because they're, they're going to meet up and they're going to sort it out. Um, and if you can gobble uh, well enough to replicate another turkey, uh, you can be that turkey that he's coming to figure out, you know, what's going on and sort things out before he gets started on his daily routine. I've watched turkeys with hens fly straight down and to completely leave those hens to go to another gobbler that's on the next ridge because they've got to sort that out. That's more important than anything to him when his feet hit the ground is sorting that out. Um, so gobbling early season when they're still in that frame of mind doing that pecking order deal uh, – can be very effective. Um, I won't say I use it a lot, but it is an effective taste, something that you need to have in your bag of tools, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, that goes right along with fighting purrs and stuff, something that you might not do a lot. But, buddy, when it works, it's like nothing else was going to work. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, it was either, you know, you were going to recognize the situation and employ that tactic and kill the turkey, or he was going to, you're going to have to come after him tomorrow and hope he had a, a better uh, attitude. That's good advice. Mm-hmm. Give him a gobble, Warb. I don't know if I can. Yeah, you can. Give him a gobble. <laughs> that was kind of a joke. <laughs> I knew of, I was going to put you on the didn't spot have enough, that. Didn't have enough air in my lungs. <laughs> he had a cricket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. I think as we wrap up here, there was a question uh, asking if uh, he would elaborate on the Pinhoti project again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah we, we, we might talk about that one more time, Dave, if you want. You kind of mentioned, you yeah, were talking absolutely. to me what the, what the word actually meant earlier. That was very interesting. Yeah, uh, Pinhoti, um, it's, it's derived from a Creek Indian word. Um, it means turkey home. Um, and it's actually a hiking trail <clears throat> that, uh, that the guy that, uh, Kenny and I are, you know, we lived, uh, I lived over in Cedartown, Georgia, is where I was born and raised, and it's right on the Alabama line, and he was from Anniston, Alabama, which is just on the other side, just literally probably an hour and a half apart. We both hunt in the same fashion, both hunt, you know, similar amounts. Um, <clears throat> like I said, he should hopefully finish up his U.S. slam uh, by the end of this spring. He's got seven states to go, and he's got them all hammered out, and his date's hammered out. So hopefully with a little luck, he can finish up his U.S. slam uh, this spring. But anyway, Sinhoti means turkey home, and uh, they're derived from a Creek Indian word, and it's a hiking trail that goes, right through he, where he and I uh, were raised. So it had, like, some significance uh, as far as that. But it meets up with the Appalachian Trail, which is a big hiking trail over here, you know, that goes all the way up uh, the East Coast, and, and a lot of people hike it and stuff. So it just made sense. Um, it was kind of, you know, a native uh, word that, that Aura always referred to turkeys in, in some form or fashion. And um, it, you know, had a, a down-home meaning for both of us. Um, so the Penhody Project is the name that we came up with for this. I don't know if you want to call it a documentary or or just a you know a follow along, a blog type thing is what we're going to start it as uh, as the season's going on um, to uh, to kind of follow he and I along on a, on a spring season. Like I said, our springs are typically seventy or more days, seventy or more wake ups that we're in the woods, you know, uh, with our vest on, shotguns over our shoulders. So uh, he and I both, like I said, we hunt alike, so we like to hunt alone, to be totally honest with you. We don't hunt with a lot of people a lot of time, but we've uh, got to come to a compromise, and then we're going to follow each other around as much as we can while we're while we're at home, because now he, uh, I've moved to Ackworth, Georgia, and he's literally moved right down the road. His job, uh, by just happenstance, seemed to move him right beside me literally the year after we met. Uh, we met up in Nashville at the Grand Nationals. Um, and uh, it's just essentially a documentary that's going to go out, go follow two guys that hunt in a little bit more of a traditional style. Uh, we don't use decoys. Um, 
don't use blinds. Uh, we, we hunt almost strictly public land uh, because we don't stay still long enough for, for it to make even sense for us to for us to even have a lease. Um, uh, so we you know do a majority of our hunting on public land. Uh, spend a lot of time out there trying to learn turkeys. We've already been out there. You you know I've been out virtually every day for the past month, maybe a little better. Um, just you know double checking things and. Um, that's just kind of what it is. It's going to be a thing to where we're going to put out a, put out a finished product uh, at the end of the season. Kind of hopefully about you know a little a couple weeks after the season ends, and we got a little time to recharge and get a few episodes ready. We're going to start putting out, and I don't know if it's going to be a daily thing or a, or a weekly thing or, or how we're going to do it, but uh, we're going to relive that whole season. Hopefully a good season. Hopefully, hopefully we got something to show y'all besides a lot of logged miles and and fruitless effort. But uh, basically, going to go back through that thing and and go through the season and 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 show it to you guys how it unfolded and and what a what trying to keep a full time job and then also turkey hunt seventy or you know even more days of spring looks like. Um, and then. You know, uh, we're going to use the uh, the social media platforms, Facebook and Instagram, to kind of allow you to, you know, allow everybody to kind of follow us as we do the documentation of the hunts. You know, mm-hmm. we're going to kind of let you follow us along as we pull out for Florida next week, as we pack the truck for Florida. If we have any success down there, we'll kind of bring that to you. Um, nothing polished, nothing edited, nothing finished. Of course, it's going to be just. You know, hey, what's up? This is this is what's what's going on right now. But that way, you you know, just to reassure everyone that yes, we're still throwing this footage down. You know, a season's really long for us, but we're gonna bring it to you as soon as we get we get it all finished up. So cool. let's hope that it uh, it comes out like we got it. You know, in our heads right now. That'll be cool. Yeah, That'll be sweet. interesting to watch at the end of the year. You know, kind of getting to see that whole process, warts and all, because that's what a lot of folks don't get to watch. They turn on turkey hunting video anymore. And, there's a gobbler running into a, to a decoy from 300 yards across the field, get shot, and that's it. You know, they yep, don't see the it. entire process like what you're talking about. I think they're going to learn a lot from it. That's going to be really cool. And that's what so we, that's, right. that's where we were watching happen. Um, I'm, on a, I'm on several forums and stuff, and all you hear is these, uh, is, is the old timers or the people that have been doing it a long time talking about the people, the new guys that are coming in and how they've got to have their, this thing to, to provoke this response or they've got to use this and that. And I'm, and I began to realize I was like, I was in that kind of that, like, yeah, I wish they wouldn't do that. Cause they're, hmm. they're missing it. Like, you know, like I said, if it's legal, you can do it. That's completely up to you. But I just feel like they're selling themselves short and they don't even know it. And it's not their fault. They didn't, they don't know that they're selling themselves short. They're having success. And they thought that was the end game. You've got a dead Turkey. That's what you were there to do. But I feel like they're they're missing a whole lot of that whole experience. They're not getting what is completely available to them if they uh, if they do it a little bit differently. If they do it differently and they don't like it, then they can always resort back to doing what they were doing. You know, it was successful for them. But there's so much more than just just keep shooting the turkey. There's so much more of an interaction and an understanding there that's available. Um, and and I think people were selling themselves short by. But you can't blame them, you know. Those, like I said earlier, those guys were like, you know, they were criticizing this younger generation that was coming into turkey hunting. But I mean, I don't see what ground you had to do that because well, how else were they supposed to learn? If you get on, you buy a DVD or you get on YouTube, that's what you saw is the blinds and the decoys, and it was successful. Like they saw that, they're like, hey, that's successful. That's what I need. They went and got it, and they're killing turkeys, and they're getting criticized for it, and they don't. They don't they didn't have the ability to do it any other way. Mm-hmm. Um, there was nothing out there that that showed them any other way or showed them that they were even missing anything out. Yeah, they thought they was, they'd found the end game, you know. So um, that's what you know. That's what we're going to try to bring to the table, hopefully, and um, and and hopefully people enjoy it and it can uh, you know it can it can it can turn into something. I think yeah. it will, man. I think we. We might have some opportunities to collaborate here this spring doing some stuff because we'll be we'll be doing our kind of public land turkey tour as well. It won't be as in as quite as involved as as what you guys are doing. We're we're gonna stay in one place, you know, a lot longer. Mm-hmm. Par- partly because mm-hmm. you guys will go in and kill a turkey in a couple of days. It may take us a week and a half, two weeks <laughs> to get into one in Alabama on public land, but. Uh, <laughs> 
that's kind of what we're going to be doing on our channel as well is uh kind of the daily grind of hunting public land we'll start in the south and then work our work our way kind of north from there but uh yeah anybody sure that wants to know about what dave and uh his buddy kenny have been or are, are doing with the penhody project we'll uh we'll let you all know i'm sure there's comments coming in like asking where to find that stuff dave do you all have an instagram or facebook page up yet yeah i have an instagram and a facebook page already it's like we literally made our first post a couple days before i left for nashville and honestly we've been trying to get out and do a little introduction so that you know we could tell people what it was going to be about basically tell them what i just told you right um and let them find that but the doggone weather here has been ridiculous i mean you can't get outside with camera equipment because it has literally rained i think for three weeks so um that's uh, i'm hoping that we're going to look like we're going to have a break in the weather we're definitely got to get something out because i leave for florida um friday so i want everybody to be able to get onto those avenues and, and find uh figure out what it's about and hopefully start following along because we're hoping to start bringing some stuff to you going to be down in south florida hunting the hunting the big swamps for uh for nine days and i tell you what i can't wait i would leave right now if it let me <laughs> that's awesome man hey we're, we're the hunting public is now following the pinhody project on instagram that's awesome yeah and also that's if fantastic. you're watching and i can't wait to watch you guys stuff because i know like it like your deer hunting stuff and like everything you guys have, have done uh since you guys started early october like it's top notch first class it shows the whole the whole process you know um you know it's not just the success pictures at the end of the story that everybody likes to see but, you know it's it's awesome to be able to see that the whole process transpire and to know why you made decisions that you made um why you were successful um and everything that you guys have done has been so transparent so that you can easily see the amount of time you know that, that it took you know, that it takes to, to take, you know, quality deer uh, consistently or just deer consistently. Um, and uh, and hopefully we'll show the same thing, and you guys will too, about what it takes to, to do to have some success with turkeys yeah. or lack of success. we we'll tell you what not to do. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, that's ex <laughs> we're really good at that. We'll show you every which way to screw it up. Eventually we'll kill oh, one, yeah. but uh, lots more uh, videos of, of failing than there is succeeding. Yeah. But. Yeah, which that that's a that's a real turkey season, you know. Yes. Everybody doesn't, you know. You show them, you don't show get every one. They don't know all the missed opportunities. Right. Yeah, yeah. If you're following along, listening, make sure you guys go over and check out uh, Dave's Instagram page there, the Pinhody Project, and also our Instagram page as well. But the hunting public, yeah. yeah and we'll post a link of... to we'll post a link to the Pinhody Project in yeah. the comments too, and and uh you know on our channels as well so everybody can follow along but we've kept you on here long Please. enough dave i'll let you i'll let you get back to it man i appreciate you coming on and visiting with us first bell absolutely buddy anytime it's great talking to, to a good group of guys uh they get it you know we uh we kind of attack this stuff we kind of the same same uh i uh, don't throw don't pull any punches kind of uh <laughs> kind of approach you know we're gonna give it all we got uh win lose or draw so. yeah 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 man it was a lot of fun thanks for thanks for coming on really yeah, appreciate it absolutely you guys uh, i hope you guys have a very successful spring season hope we get some good weather and some whittling turkeys hopefully a lot of two-year-olds that's one that i like <laughs> that's right buddy too. we'll be in touch man thanks a lot for coming on yes sir all right thanks see you guys all right take care all right everybody that is going to wrap it up for tonight's the hunting public podcast brought to you by legendary whitetails and uh we appreciate y'all joining us this is a little yeah. bit longer episode yeah, but like covered a lot of ground some really good stuff like yeah. what he's saying about about turkey hunting and and people not really getting to see the whole yeah. picture you that's see a, that a lot more up here where we live yeah you know he if he's seeing that down in georgia even that kind of really makes me think well it's i mean I, that's a great way to put it too because you know at the end of the day success is you know what i think too many people are locked in on and you know it was never really about that like i think for us all growing up you know it's just the process of learning and oh learning to, is, is always so learning fun. you know if you get them every time then it you know you're like like you said you're cutting yourself short now if that's just your goal and you don't care about much else you know that's fine too like he said but yeah it's 
and, it, and you'll become a better turkey hunter. Also you'll become a better deer hunter. Yeah, you will. I mean, 100%. your woodsmanship skills will get better I, as you start to travel around and move around and see some of these different places that the wild turkey lives across the country and stuff. You're gonna yeah. you're gonna come across various different situations like what we've been talking about with Dave. Yeah. And the more adaptable you can be, you know, the more open I guess you can be to all these various tactics that you can have turkey hunting. Ultimately, the better experience you're gonna have. Yeah. And that's what hooks. That's what really hooks us. Yeah. You know, is just getting to see all these places. And I feel truly feel that a lot of you know my turkey hunting growing up helped me become you know a better whitetail hunter. Well, as well, we always talk about how the actual act of turkey hunting is way more fun to us, mm -hmm. at least in this room, I think. Than the than... process of deer hunting. You know, or the process of deer hunting is fun, but the act of turkey hunting yeah. is probably more fun, yeah. at least to me. Yeah. 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 But yeah. Well. All right, that's it. That's enough. We're done. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for Greg, joining Greg's us. Greg's probably like, guys, shut up. We'll see you next time. Greg's <laughs> soup is cold. We have got to go. <laughs>